Today on Points for Trying, what happens when a tire company reaches for the stars? I've got three words for you. Blimps in space. Hey everyone, welcome back to Points for Trying. I'm Brandon. And I'm Jessica. I'm an engineer. And I'm a science enthusiast. And together we celebrate ideas and inventions that were unsuccessful, forgotten, or just plain weird. Now, Jessica, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the word Goodyear? Tires. Is there a second thing? What's the second thing? Blimps. Now, how far down the list would space be? Not on the list at all. <laughs> <laughs> well... Let's talk about Goodyear's inflatable space stations. Goodyear's work in aviation goes all the way back to 1909, when they made fabrics and tires used in airplanes. And of course, who can forget the famous Goodyear blimp? But in 1961, they took things to the next level when they gave a presentation to Congress entitled, Inflatable Structures in Space. At the time, NASA had already conducted a few experiments with satellite balloons, or as they called them, satelloons. <laughs> <laughs> that is ridiculous. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a 10 out of 10 name, right? <laughs> One of their first space balls was Echo 1, a 100-foot sphere with a metallic surface that was designed to reflect radio signals. Is that similar to what a satellite does? Sort of. Modern communication satellites do kind of receive signals and then they have electronics on board that will, you know, process that and send it back down to the earth. This, uh, just think of it as a big mirror. You know, it doesn't have any electronics on, on it. It just, things bounce off of it. I see. There's actually something really fun about this one. I thought, and you might think, well, it's a big balloon in space. What if it gets hit by something like an asteroid or you know, a little tiny piece of space debris. Right. But because it's in space, once it's inflated, it doesn't actually need the air inside of it to keep its shape. If a hole gets poked in it, the air will come out, but it'll still stay in that round shape, which is pretty cool. That is fascinating. Yeah, there's, there's no air crushing it, so it just kind of stays that way, this big empty balloon. There's zero PSI against it. Yeah. Fascinating. Echo 1 was basically nothing more than a giant metal balloon, but Goodyear thought even bigger. Space stations, re-entry vehicles, and giant solar reflectors were all on the drawing board. The theory behind them was all the same. If you want to send something big and bulky into space, why not squish it down into a small canister and inflate it once it's there? Think of it like Space Ikea. <laughs> I mean, we do that a lot with various other products. Send it without the water, add it to it so it's lighter to ship, or send it all squished down, and then when you open up the plastic bag, it'll take in the air and get bigger. I can see where they would think that would work. Oh my god, like those mattresses that come in the rolls. Yeah, which we're not going to promote because they don't pay us. Exactly. We will promote them as soon as they start paying us, and we're we're waiting on that mattress company I won't name. Exactly. So get on the horn, mattress companies. I want to show you some of the uh, photos from their presentation, which they gave to Congress. The advantages of inflatable space structures. They've got four. Packaging ability, ease of erection, lightweight, and overload recovery. What does overload recovery mean? You know, in a bouncy house, if you step on it, it like sinks down, but then when you jump off, it brings back up to the shape it was. So if it gets hit by something, you know, it'll flop over, but then it'll spring right back up. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Exactly. So in addition to it being a great way to launch small things and have them inflate up into big things, you know, if it, if it um, gets hit or something, it, it's a bit more forgiving than a, a rigid structure. Mm -hmm. So in their presentation, they mentioned the Goodyear Inflatoplane. Great name. Uh, which was actually made, and I think we will do an episode on it at some point. But they go right from this little tiny airplane that was stuffed into a canister and would inflate into a really small ultralight aircraft to 
inflatable space stations. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in that. <laughs> But like the kind you see in sci-fi movies, the big gigantic ring spinning around, the little spoke in the middle. That part looks cool, but I don't want to be in that if it's not metal. I, I do not feel protected from the aliens. You know what makes me feel better about it is it kind of looks like a tire. And Goodyear knows how to make tires. <laughs> they know what they're doing. Right? I, I, I think there's a method to their madness here. Oh, that one looks even more like a tire. Yeah. It has fewer rings. Uh, they actually made one, which is basically a gigantic tire. This is a uh, prototype. <laughs> I, I love it. That is fascinating. It's, um, it's a little bit taller than the people. I guess they're not expecting you to have a whole lot of stuff going on in there. No, the, the, and this is, you know, kind of a, a smaller prototype. I think the actual one would be quite a bit bigger, but, you know, they they actually made a prototype of it. Was the thought process that they would make it like that and then smush it down, take all the air out, and then inflate it in space? Because I'm just not understanding. Yeah. What, but with what air, right? Because we just said there's no PSI, so it would take a great force to f inflate it in space, wouldn't it? Right, they would have to bring their own air. So, you know, this would launch, and then they'd have, you know, a bunch of pressurized air tanks. I mean, it's space. It's bring your own air, BYOA. <laughs> Giant whippets. <laughs> I mean, imagine a whippet you could just live inside. I'm sure somebody out there has imagined that. Don't try that. <laughs> no, don't, don't try that at home, kids. We are not responsible for... <laughs> or a giant inflatable balloon to go into space. Don't, don't try that either. No, I, I am going to try that. <laughs> In other news, I'm looking for another engineer to help out with this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I am giving legal and medical advice right now. <laughs> you should always try and make a balloon and put it in space. I'm going to stick with trying to make my balloons so awesome that they can carry my house away like in the movie Up. <laughs> Well, you know, was that uh, was that inspired by Goodyear? We can't say that it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to living in space, uh, you can actually come back from space with what they're calling re-entry vehicles. So this would actually be an inflatable little spaceship, like an inflatable space shuttle, and they would come back down uh, to Earth. So I know you didn't like the idea of an inflatable space station, but what about hurtling through the Earth's atmosphere at thousands of miles an hour in an inflatable airplane. So I watched the movie Apollo 13 and I saw what <laughs> happens to the heat shields. And I just don't think that this rubber inflatable reentry vehicle is going to hold up to it. To be fair, it was a rubber that had a metal mesh inside of it. But I don't know if they actually were able to test its, its heat resistant properties. The pictures are fascinating. See, this is where the inflation would come from. There's a little spherical tank of helium that would pump up and fill all of that. Hmm. So what's your, what are your thoughts on inflatable space technology? You think this is going to take off? It might take off, but I don't know if it will land. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think that it's the smartest idea. It just feels like, even if you had the metal mesh, it feels like the rubber would melt. I just don't think that it would hold up. It's probably why we don't know of Goodyear space stations made of rubber. I mean, you've never been to Goodyear Station? No, I don't think I'm rich enough to do that. I mean, you got to know somebody who knows somebody, but I shouldn't rub it in your face, but Goodyear Station is pretty cool. Not for nothing, but if you somehow get up to space and you don't take me with you, <laughs> I'm going to be so sad. <laughs> If you go into space without me, you better stay up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I would take you to space with me if I was going to see a Goodyear station. Oh, thank you. That's what friends do. If I ever get the opportunity to go to space... You'll send a post. I will take you too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll send you a moon rock. My friend went to space and all I got was this dumb postcard. <laughs> <laughs> so... As wacky as this idea is, 
I think this is one of the ideas that actually survived into the present day fairly well, considering. So we talked about inflatable space stations, and no, Goodyear doesn't have a space station orbiting the Earth right now, but there actually is an inflatable module on the International Space Station. Tell me more. It is called BEAM, the Bigelow Expendable Activity Module. And it was made by a company called Bigelow Aerospace. Very niche joke, but I think that Bigelow should stick to tea. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's the tea guy that like just got rich and was like, I want to go to space. Kind of like how Virgin had cell phones and planes and rockets. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I, I'm a big fan of Bigelow tea, so... If this is the same company behind it, then I, you know, s send me up there. Sure. <laughs> so is it still on the space station and is it actually being used? Do you know? Uh, as far as I know, it's still up there and uh, people have actually gone inside it and done experiments. I got to say that bodes well for when we actually do points at the end of this. I know. And it's not only that. Remember the re-entry vehicles. NASA actually tested an inflatable version of one of those. How did it go? Pretty good. The idea is to send down a capsule back from orbit to the Earth and have an inflatable heat shield that's way, way bigger than the capsule itself. And since it has more surface area, it spreads out all of the heating. Oh. And, you know, keeps the temperatures lower. It's called the lofted the low earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator. And yes, the acronyms are going to get bigger and more complicated the more this episode goes on. I'm terrified. Good. <laughs> oh, strap in. Again, they haven't really used it for any actual spacecraft, but the test was a success. That is so interesting to watch. Well, we've talked enough about Goodyear. So I think it's time to mention today's sponsor. That's right. Today's episode of Points for Trying is brought to you by Firestone Tires. Firestone knows that you want tires from a company that focuses on tires. Unlike some companies, they're not focused on going into space, and they don't care how many stars your favorite restaurant has. Firestone has one goal and one goal only making big rubber donuts that you put on your car and fill with air. So when you're looking for tires to keep you and your family safe, look for the company that doesn't do anything else. Firestone. They make tires. And that's it. In 1957, Russia launched the first ever satellite into orbit, Sputnik. It was pretty small, didn't do much, and only stayed in orbit for a few months. But a year before that even happened, Goodyear's engineers were already drawing up plans for gigantic space stations and rocket ferries, and the name for this concept was the Goodyear Meteor, which stood for Manned Earth Satellite Terminal Evolving from Earth to Orbit Ferry Rockets. I think this is the most strained acronym we've ever encountered on this show. <laughs> There's three words in the sentence that aren't even in the acronym. There's manned, Earth satellite, terminal, evolving from, and then Earth to orbit is the E and the O. <laughs> then there's ferry, and then rockets. <laughs> the ferries always get forgotten. There's more words that aren't in the acronym than there are in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it doesn't even make sense just looking at it. You can, you can squeeze a lot of interpretations in, but that doesn't mean anything to me. It leads me to believe that Goodyear would have had an amazing space program if they stuck with it because they have reached NASA levels of goofy acronyms. This picture, by the way, is like, mwah, chef's kiss, peak 1956. Oh, it gets even 1956-er. <laughs> You just wait. <laughs> Let's start with the second half of that phrase. Earth to orbit ferry rockets. The space ferry was a three-stage, fully reusable rocket system. 
Three space planes, each with their own crew, would be stacked on top of each other for the launch. The biggest stage on the bottom would boost the two smaller stages as high as it could and then detach and fly back to land on a runway. The second stage would do the same, and the lucky crew of the smallest stage would actually get to go into space. So you can kind of think of it like the human centipede of rockets. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it looks kind of fun. Like there's this little rocket on the top, and then this bigger rocket kind of like chomps its rear end and like holds it. And then a yet bigger third rocket like chomps that medium sized rocket on the butt. Like you, you, like the nose cones like separate into four segments. And then they just go, and like, I don't know, like it, just imagine like three kids in a trench coat, like standing on each other's shoulders. I like that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it even looks funnier when they, when they separate and like, it, it's like a bird opening its beak and like shooting it out. It's kind of like when a predator has a prey in its mouth and the prey gets away. Oh yeah. <laughs> I do kind of feel bad for the crews of the medium and big rockets because, like, they got to, like, suit up and, like, go through the launch process and everything, and they don't even get to orbit. They're just driving someone to space. A space Uber. Yeah. Well, that is hilarious. But now for the manned Earth satellite terminal part. The plan was to use the ships themselves as building blocks for the space station. The cylindrical rocket bodies would be the perfect shape for forming the station's core, and the wings could be taken apart and used as structural elements. It's almost like they predicted the shipping container house craze. I love the shipping container house craze. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get me started on shipping container houses. <laughs> I mean... I have legitimately lived in essentially a shipping container before, so I know the downsides to it, namely very, very cold in the winter, very, very hot in the summer. But if I had the whole thing and I could build on top of it and I could make it my own and put insulation in there, I think it would be so much fun. It would be fun, and I do think they look pretty cool. But if I had the money to outfit a shipping container house and do it the right way and make it livable and nice. You just want a house? Yeah, I I just have enough money to make a house. You got a point. Right, but it's hard to build a house in space. So this idea actually seems pretty promising. The rockets get into space, they kind of like strip them down for parts. The main body of the rocket is this pressurized metal cylinder, which is much better than rubber. Better than rubber. The station would be built in stages, as each arriving ship would bring more astronaut construction workers and promptly be cannibalized for parts. The final plan for this orbiting chop shop was a 75 foot by 900 foot cylinder with a 500 foot diameter wheel on the end of it. And for scale, that's basically something the size of the Chrysler building. But in space. In space! <laughs> <laughs> now I'm imagining if the Chrysler building was made out of the pickup trucks that all of the workers drove to the job site. This is where we're getting our steel from. Like you just drive the cement truck, empty out the cement, and then you like take everything apart and melt down the metal to make the I-beams, and bingo bango, you got yourself a Chrysler building. <laughs> Literally a Chrysler building. Oh, I didn't even realize that. That would be perfect branding. <laughs> so I, I want to look at a few drawings of the stages of construction. You know, first, they join two ships together, nose to nose, and, you know, use the metal from the wings and from the other bits to build out the structure. And then they add more and more until it's this gigantic tube with this huge rotating wheel on the end of it. This reminds me of a toy from the 1950s where you would have these wooden wheels that had holes drilled into it and then you had wooden dowel rods that were painted and you would stick them in. I think I remember playing with those. Those were rad. 
They were awesome. My dad had them. So we used to play with my dad's old versions of it when I was a kid. And that picture that you showed me looks exactly like that wheel with one of the wooden dowel rods stuck into it. And I wonder if that's where they got the idea from when their kid was playing with a toy. Because it would make sense based on the years that that was designed <laughs> and the years that that was a popular toy. You think some tired Goodyear engineer is like at home on a Saturday and his kid's like, Dad, Dad, I built a space station. And he like takes one look at it and he's like, I'm going into the office. By golly, Charlie, you did build a space station. This is this is the 1950s version of work-life balance. <laughs> and then Monday morning, he goes to his boss like, I got it. We're making space stations now. Uh, Bill, we're a tire company. Space stations. The future's in space stations, you see? Everything is space. <laughs> <laughs> so... We haven't made any spaceships that get chopped up into space stations once they go to orbit. Yet. But to Goodyear's credit, the actual space station, the ISS, was made by sending up modules and then connecting them together. So there's a, you know, little bit of a, an idea in there. I bet it's because that idea has merit, regardless of what you're trying to build in stages, right? So maybe everybody was kind of hovering around the same idea and the one that we're actually using for the space station is the one that actually just won out. Uh, that's a fair point. I suppose Goodyear wasn't the company that invented building big things out of smaller pieces. We've been doing that for a while. There's a concept where basically people are all dancing around the same sort of invention and so that's when you have people come up with the same invention and then there's patent issues because, oh, I made this over in France. No, I made this in Wichita, right? I can't move on before saying that I'm pretty sure I could have come up with a better acronym because they clearly wanted the name to be Meteor. Clearly. And they just worked backwards from there. So what about moving everything to Earth orbit reusably? Ah, I like that. No wasted words, no hyphens. Come on, good year. Hire me. He's your marketing guy. Come on. We'll restart the space program. We'll get some better acronyms. I don't know what you're doing with your engineering degree currently, but I think this could be your future engineering degree usage. Naming wacky programs. That's all I've ever wanted to do. That's what I went to school to try and do. There you go. And I, I, think, I think I'm getting closer to the dream. Ah, glad we could help you realize your dreams. <laughs> All right. It's about that time again. Does it get points for trying? Oh, do they ever. So we're going to start with space blimps. Well, right off the bat, it gets a point for letting us say the word Sataloon. Sataloon. How can you not say that word? It just reminds me of pantaloons. <laughs> Gets another point for it, just the, the sheer audacity of a tire company trying to start a space program. I mean, we, we should all shoot for our dreams like that. And, hey, I've got a free slogan for you, Goodyear. Goodyear, our products touch the ground and the stars. You have a marketing future, my friend. <laughs> Hire me, good year. Uh, and it gets one more point for possibly being the inspiration for the Chinese spy balloon. Ooh. Did you mean balloon or balloons? I don't know. We may have already said too much. If, if we don't upload anything after this, it's because they've got to us. Or we took another year hiatus. Or that. <laughs> I, I think um, for me, it gets points because it gets a point because as you pointed out, there is actually something inflatable on the space station. There is actually something there. So the concept, while maybe not executed perfectly by Goodyear, did prove to be something functional. I have to withhold a point for that insane re-entry vehicle that's made with rubber. <laughs> so, so it cannot get that. But it gets a point because of the prototype that was actually made, that photo that you showed, where it was a small version of the space station and what it could be. It did look functional. 
just how do you get it there? How do you actually fill it up? B-Y-O-A, bring your own air. Got to bring your own air. A little weird for me, but I, I can see how that would work. That's what I tell all my party guests. Bring your own air. <laughs> <laughs> do not steal my oxygen. Bring your own. Hey, you think air grows on trees? <laughs> I mean, in a way it does, but... All right, so that is five points for El Blimpo. And now for the Meteor. You know, again, it gets a point for just goal setting. Before the first satellite was ever launched into space, they had plans for three-stage reusable spaceships and space stations with hundreds of people living inside of them. Aim high. I'm also going to give it a point for the terrible acronym because that might have been the most ambitious part of this project yet. Trying to cram that many words into an acronym that stood for Meteor. It was ambitious. Godspeed, you linguistic nuts. <laughs> All right. For me, the meteor, I'm going to also have to give it a point for how creative they were. And I'm going to give it a point for in a time when reusability was not something that they were very conscientious of they were doing something reusable. They were being green before green was popular, and I got to hand it to them. They were ahead of their time on that one. Yeah, they were really thinking about the Earth. Yeah. Even when they were trying to leave it. All right, so final score, Space Blimp, five. Meteor, four. Space Blimp wins. Space Blimp wins. All right. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. And as always, if at first you don't succeed, you still might have a good year. Hey. <laughs> <laughs>